in the introduction, I was talking about Zerubbabel. Maybe not a name that runs off everybody's tongue straight away. Mm. But Zerubbabel was the one I was quoting from Zechariah, where the Lord has said, not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I want to link in this whole theme of thinking about the spirit right now. Now, a few weeks ago, I was walking through a car parking lounge, as you do, and I turned and I saw this big sticker on the windscreen of this car. And it nearly filled up the old of the windscreen. And it said, one life, live it. I couldn't get it out of my head. I thought, one life, live it. That is a great thing to say. I wonder if it covers up the old of his windscreen. And it seemed the kind of car which I didn't really expect it. It came a bit boy racer sort of car. So one life, live it. I thought, yeah, can't argue with you there. But as believers, okay, how do we live actually live our lives, not just go through life. How do we live it to the purposes and plans that God has given to each and every one of us? Now, a few weeks ago, it was this thing called Pentecost. A few people have heard of that, yeah, okay. So Pentecost, obviously, for New Covenant believers like us, is highly significant, would you agree? Yeah. Now, don't worry, because even though it's not Pentecost today, you are allowed to talk about it on the wrong date. <laughs> yeah? I know I'm not in a religious setting now, so it's okay. So, what I want you to look at first of all is Pentecost in the Hebrew, it's actually a biblical feast, okay? And it's called in the Hebrew Shavuot. You might have heard of that. A few people are nodding. <laughs> now, Shavuot is where it all began back in the older covenant. I like calling it the older covenant, not the old covenant. Because when you say the old covenant, people think, it's old, isn't it? Chill that out then, it's rubbish. No point looking at it. So it's the older covenant. And in Exodus 34, 22, it says this. And you shall celebrate the feast of weeks. That is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So it's like a bit of a harvest festival as well. And Jewish people around the world still take on board this biblical feast, doesn't belong to the Jews by the way, called Shavuot. Now we know it as Pentecost because it has an even more future fulfillment. But where did Shavuot come from? Well, first of all, you remember, the Israelites left Egypt. Okay? You can read all about that in Exodus. And in about the third month, they arrived at a place called Sinai, Mount Sinai. Moses said, well, then camp around that, because the Lord is going to do something so dramatic. He's going to come down, talk to you, communicate with you as his own people. And you can read all about that in Exodus chapter 19. It's a breathtaking chapter. We often dismiss it because it's, it's on covenant, isn't it? Don't need that anymore. But if you actually read how God communicated with his people, it's breathtaking. At the same time, there was no mediator, was there? There was no Jesus at that point. So the way he communicated was different from how he communicates to us now. So Moses said to the people, spend a good three days, get yourself cleansed, get ready, because the Lord's going to come down and talk to you. And if you read the chapter, you'll notice there were the thunderings and the lightnings and the shofar that grew louder and louder and louder. My life, this was dramatic stuff. If you'd been there that day, you probably would have put your hands over your ears, <laughs> thinking, I can't stand this anymore, that God is speaking to me. And it was interesting, because when I read a few commentaries on that, particularly Jewish commentaries around this chapter, they actually talked about how the voice of God through the thunderings and the shofar actually broke up into 70 or more languages and went around the whole world. Now, I'm not saying that did happen, but I just thought, that's interesting, with the whole language thing going on there, as you'll see when we look at Pentecost. But God was desperate to communicate with his people. It was the giving of the, what we call the Torah, the giving of the instructions, the law, which basically he was saying, you can't do it on your own. You need a Messiah. He will come one day, but in the meantime, you're my special chosen people through whom the promised Messiah will come. And that I will be your God, you will be my people, but there's a future still to come and a blessing. So a dramatic, a dramatic um, start there. So the Torah was really where the Ten Commandments were given, written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. In the meantime, he takes the tablets of stone down the mountain. What are the people all up to? They built an altar to an unknown god, haven't they? They're going crazy. Well, to the golden calf. They're going wild. So much for what they declared to begin with. To start with, they all stood around the mountain. They all went, 
We will do whatever the Lord says. That's what they all said. We will do whatever you say, Lord, before he'd even said anything. How fickle can people be? You see? <laughs> but they didn't they were still in the older covenant at that point, weren't they? So now through the prophets, God has spoken many times about a new covenant that would come along. It's quite a breathtaking concept if you were still in the old covenant, because this is what he says in Jeremiah chapter 20, chapter 31, if you want to make a note of that. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, he's given a breathtaking promise to those in the older covenant. This is what he says. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. But this new covenant I make with them, I make in their hearts. I'll write with the spirit on their hearts my laws of love. I won't be writing on a tablet of stone with laws. I'll be writing on their heart with love. So that's a powerful, that was an amazing promise that was given at that point. Now remember as well, when you read about Jesus in the New Testament and what he did and when he went to the cross and everything like that, nothing was by accident. Okay? Everything was mirrored in a biblical feast or a fulfillment of a pro prophecy given probably hundreds of years before. So when he went to the cross, as we know, he was fulfilling being the Passover lamb. Okay, you know that? He was fulfilling Passover. His blood became our new protection, didn't it? And it was much more than just a, like an everyday animal sort of lamb. That could only cover your sins. The blood of the lamb was going to take your sins away. So he's fulfilled Passover. Then he rose from the dead. And he rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. I don't know if you knew that. Because he was the firstborn from the dead. He was the first fruits of the harvest to come. So praise God, Jesus rose from the dead. He has that new, he opened the doorway for all of us. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, didn't they? I've overcome death and Hades itself. The one thing people fear more than anything, pain and death, Jesus had overcome it. Hallelujah. Now, 50 days after the resurrection, something else happened. Pentecost, Shavuot, okay? 50 days after, where are the disciples at this point? They're in the upper room, aren't they? Mm -hmm. With the women and the disciples in the upper room. They've seen the Lord rise from the dead. The hearts are full of joy. But he's ascended back to heaven now. Oh, we're all on our own again. Oh no, what's going to happen to us? Well, he said something about a spirit coming, didn't he? Maybe we should hang around a bit longer then. Yeah, but when will it come? There's no sign of it yet. Oh, I'm not sure, but he did say wait and power will come. But when's he going to be? See, they didn't know. And they weren't, by the way, they weren't born again at this point either. They were sat there, getting a little bit tetchy maybe, what's going to happen? And then, as you can read, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit arrived, didn't he, with that wind, that powerful wind, the tongues of fire, the speaking in the unknown languages about the things that Jesus had done, about the glories of God. And the Jewish people hearing it are thinking, I can't understand it. I'm hearing it all in my own language. Are you hearing it in your language? Yeah, I am. And it's, in, it's incredible. Ah, oh, too much drinking. Look at them. I can't believe it. The way they behave. No, says Peter. This is what the prophet Joel spoke of. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on some flesh, Jewish flesh, all flesh, all flesh. So that means if you're a Hindu now or a a Muslim now, or an ultra-Orthodox Jew, or just an average person walking the streets of Grimsby, God will pour his spirit out on all flesh when we reach out to ask him for that. So that's all flesh, not just the chosen few any longer. And also, he will write on our hearts that new law of love. He will write on our hearts that desire for his word, that desire to love one another, not like in the older covenant. Praise God. So, God had, like I said, a much bigger vision that we would all be incorporated into the commonwealth of Israel, if you like, to become heirs of the promise that he originally gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you've been grafted in to all of those promises. Amazing. So let's look, just to show you this, in Ephesians 
chapter 2, just a couple of verses I wanted to read you. I know it doesn't appear on the screen, because when I do it, I don't have time to type things on PowerPoint. So I do the old-fashioned way and go back to the Bible. So Ephesians chapter 2, and I just want to look at two verses. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. So the separation has gone. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Two became one. So Jew or Gentile does not matter now. Okay? We're all one in him. So if I had some Jewish brothers here who now know Jesus as their Messiah, we're all one. It's not like, oh, they're the Jews, right? We're, we're Gentiles. We're all one flesh now through him. There's neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, all are one in him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. So, so what happened at Sinai then, as I was just saying, was fulfilled at the Pentecost. When the Spirit arrived, this was phenomenal. You know, Satan had seen a lot of things happen. The cross Jesus suffering in hell for you and for I. But at Pentecost, everything came together, as I'll show you in a minute. But before I do that, another scripture for you to make a note of. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is very interesting. I'd encourage you to have a look at it later on. Because it goes in some good detail comparing Sinai and the experience of Shabbat there with the Torah. And the experience in the upper room at Pentecost and the difference between the two. So it's Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verse 18. Okay, so, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire. That's Mount Sinai that we've just been talking about. And to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. So God spoke in words to the people. So that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore because they could not endure it at that time. For they could not endure what was commanded. And, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it was stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you, so now we're going into the newer covenant, the fulfillment of Pentecost. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Wow. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of of sprinkling that speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. Remember, Jesus' blood speaks better things. Blood speaks, did you know that? But the voice of Jesus' blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel's blood. That spoke out revenge and murder and death and all that. Jesus' blood speaks out forgiveness and healing and redemption and all of those words over us. So... In the book of Acts, if you want to actually read the account of the Pentecost, it's in chapter 2, and I would encourage you to read that, but that was the fulfilment of the biblical feast of Shavuot. So what I wanted to look at now was what actually did happen then in the upper room. We talk about tongues, we talk about flames of fire, and for us as New Covenant believers, because we've all received Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, and I assume you've received baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't, and if you're watching this and you haven't, you can ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life, to fill you right up and to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. Now some people, I'll just mention this as well. Years ago when I was younger, I was brought up with a much more religious kind of upbringing. And when I got born again, I did not really understand the things of the Holy Spirit. I did not understand this concept of baptism in the Holy Spirit and how that was different from water baptism etc so I got baptised in the Holy Spirit 
before I got baptised with water. And I remember a lot of people at the time saying, well, that's a load of muddled upness. That can't be right. I think you've got that wrong. It can't be the real thing. See, that's religion. At the time, I did not realise. But I was. So it's nothing to be confused about. But in the age we're living in now, I think you'll agree, the things in the world are, shall I say, hotting up. If you watch the news, you don't even have to watch the news, just look around you. We're living in not just the last days. I would say we're living in the last hour. And we've got the exciting opportunity. We're alive right now in the last hour. Isn't that exciting? Think of all the believers that have come and gone who would have given everything to have lived in these days that we're in now. But to live in these days that we're living in now, would you agree that we need all the power we can have? Yeah. We do, don't we? So if the Holy Spirit is there available, ask and you shall receive the Holy Spirit and he will guide you in the word. He will increase your love. He will increase your desire for all the things of the Lord. We need that, don't we? We need the ability for healings and do miracles and all of that. And we can all do that, by the way, through the Holy Spirit within us. Awesome. So let's go back to the upper room. So Satan had already seen Jesus on the cross, thought he'd beaten him. Not so. Took him to hell itself. Thought I was going to annihilate him. Not so. Jesus overcame him. It says it in the scriptures that he stripped the enemy of all authority and power. Hallelujah. Amen. And he became born again, if you like, in that place. The firstborn from the dead. But he rose physically from the grave. Hallelujah. And now he sends his Holy Spirit to us. So, what did the enemy see in the upper room? What can we remind ourselves of that we got when we received Jesus and we got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, he saw men and women recreated. He'd never seen that before. That was incredible. Recreated, a new species, never existed before. Supernatural DNA, spirit man, regenerated. He saw your sins blotted out as though they'd never happened. Wow, that had never happened before, phenomenal. He saw the power and the energy of the Holy Spirit operating in people. Now, in the Older Covenant, the Holy Spirit came upon people and then it left, didn't it? You might remember some characters like Saul. The Holy Spirit would come on them for a time, but then when things changed, it departed again. But now, as New Covenant believers, the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you, filled with the Holy Spirit. That is a completely different situation now. Wow. And the enemy had never seen people energised and powered with the Spirit of God on the inside of them. He knew he was in trouble then. He saw people now having the authority to use the name of Jesus in praying for healings, in miraculous signs, in doing all those things that Jesus did and more. You can use the authority of Jesus' name as a believer now. Awesome. He saw hearts that would have been, well, just getting by, I suppose, filled up with joy. And remember how Kenny shared with us a few weeks ago, joy is not to be confused with happiness. Happiness is based on your surroundings, things that come and go in your life. Joy is supernatural. It's knowing Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. It's that truth on the inside of you that cannot be shaken, whatever your circumstances. He saw chains being shaken off. People that had been chained up with difficult things in their lives or things they could never get separated from, the chains just fell off. Amazing. That had never happened before. Prisoners set free. Glory. He saw faith grow in people. Okay? Normally people just got by, not quite sure what's going to happen tomorrow really, but now all of a sudden the faith is growing as they're reading the word and they're becoming bold. Remember what we shared with a few weeks ago? In the supernatural, you've got to step out, haven't you? So it's a step of boldness, normally first, that will precede the anointing in that way. He saw men and women taken out of his grip and transferred to the kingdom of light in God's love. Hallelujah. He saw righteousness become a reality in people. That had never happened before. People now know that they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Before, they just felt, hmm, I'm just a worm, aren't I? I'm nothing special. 
but now they know who they are in him. He saw a new language spoken, not just the language of tongues. Tongues, obviously, yes, that is the evidence of being baptised in the Holy Spirit. And if you have not received that, as I said before, ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life and give you that full immersion. But he also saw a language of love as people started to love one another. The unity started to grow. Now, I've shared this before, that when you go to a country that's got persecution of believers, one thing you'll tend to find is stronger unity and love between the believers. So that's one thing we're praying, not just for Britain, but for the Grimsby area as well, for stronger unity and love, because that's an evidence that people will see that you love one another and they, they'll know Amen. that that's of God. They'll know that you're about the things of God. Awesome. So love, and that's a powerful thing. And people often say, yeah, but how do I operate in the supernatural? How can I get healing done? How can I do this? The bottom line really is the love thing again, isn't it? It's knowing how you are loved by God, who you are in him, loving brothers and sisters, not just here, but remembering brothers and sisters who've woken up today in countries like North Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay, You can't just say Jesus is Lord. The censors around your room probably that are picking up everything you're saying. You can't just go out on the streets and say, hey, have you heard about Jesus? I don't think so. But they're our brothers and sisters. So we intercede and pray for them and empower them. You know, I was reading something the other day about somebody from North Korea who has said, we know people in the West and the world are praying for us, and that is such a source of strong foundation and power to us, just knowing that you're praying for them. Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? Moving on, he saw people now standing, get this one, in the presence of God with no guilt, with no inferiority, and with no condemnation. That really rocked hell to its core. Mm -hmm. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, is there? We don't have a spirit of timidity or fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So we don't have any of those things, and if we've got inferiority complexes or guilt, or condemnation, they're not of God. That's not what God wants for you. It's the enemy trying to do the battle in your mind. So we have to remove those, cast those off, and remember who we are in him. Praise God. Moving on. The other thing, he feared more than anything else the word of God on people's, on believers' lips and in their hearts, speaking it out. That was just about unmanageable. How on earth is he going to cope with that? He's never had people like that before. A new generation of people who were speaking out his word, believing it, operating in faith. That is just blew hell apart. Praise God. He really did. So how, how does he tackle that? He's trying to smother this. And you'll notice many countries on this earth. Even this country. We went through a period, didn't we, called the Dark Ages or something like that where this was just written in, say, Latin. Nobody knew nothing about it until a certain person came along, Martin Luther, Reformation. Eventually the message came to the people. But the enemy tries to subdue and keep you away from the word every which way he can. Every which way he can. And even in nations where it's hard to get the word in. You know, I've said this to people before. If you go to a nation like Iran and you just dumped a load of Bibles in a street in the middle of the night, next morning, they'd be gone, right? And do you know what would happen? There'd be people pouring through them, reading them, making notes, studying it, couldn't get enough of it. If you dumped a load of Bibles, maybe in Britain somewhere, well, I don't know, but they'd probably end up in a skip or something like that. See what I mean? Hearts are so hungry for the word in countries where persecution is rife. But Jesus said, I will build my church in the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. So he's building his church. So even when you look at these nations and think, oh, it's terrible for these people. No, something powerful is going on because of what happens in the upper room at Pentecost. Now, he knows that this new breed of people, the upper room people, if you want to call them that, feed on the word. And when they feed on the word, they become more like Jesus. So he knows that this is the problem. That's why the word is so important 
to meditate on it. We were talking about meditation when you came this morning. That's why it's so important, not just to read the scriptures, but meditate on it. Think about it. You know, during the middle of the day, people sometimes ask me, I said, well, I don't know, you're having your lunch break, you're driving down the road. A scripture just pops in your head. You're mulling it over a bit, thinking about that. That's meditation. And as you start to think more on Jesus during the day, more opportunities open up for you, more likeness like him you become. So today, what we're going to finish on, we've got the communion, so we're going to do that in a few moments. But just thinking of this whole concept of feeding, feeding on the word, feeding on Jesus' body and his blood. Now with that in mind, I just wanted to share a couple of verses from John. So this is, I'm turning to John now, if you want to make a note of any of these scriptures. I'm turning to John 6. And Jesus got into this, it's quite a long chapter actually, he got into this a bit of a debate going on here with the Jews. They could not grasp what he was talking about. And I just want to read a few of these verses to sort of link in to what we're going to look at with communion. So it's John 6, and I'll have a look at verse 53. Jesus said to them, so he's speaking to the Jewish people, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead, but he who eats this bread will live forever. So when you eat the symbols of Jesus' body and blood, it's easy to think, oh, it's a cracker, isn't it? Yeah, so that's carbohydrate, and that's a juice drink made with water and some syrupy liquid. No, 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 no. They're just symbolic, okay? So we're doing it in remembrance of Jesus' broken body and his shed blood and remembering what he achieved at the cross when he rose bodily from the grave and when he sent his Holy Spirit in the upper room at Pentecost. So... We'll, we'll take those round now. Thank you, Emily. So we just hold the bread and the symbol of the wine. And remember, communion doesn't have to just be done in church. See, I grew up believing I had to have an ordained minister. Okay. And I had to do it in a church setting. Otherwise, right, it won't work. Or something bad will happen to me. That's what I thought. But then you get the revelation and realize, hang on a minute. It's for any time, any place, any moment. All you have to do is think, what am I doing? Jesus' body, his sacrifice for me. What did he do for me, etc. Then it generates power in you. Why? Because you're feeding on his body and his blood. So you're affecting your physical body. You're affecting it. That's amazing, isn't it? You're affecting it positively. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. And... So, if you were an example, I was talking about this with Danny earlier, and we were talking about Joseph Prince and how he ministered on this. If somebody, for example, had a health problem, and the doctor had said, here are your tablets, please take them three times a day. So you would happily take your tablets, or maybe not happily. But what about, say you took that three times a day, you'd think, oh, that's stupid, I've never done that before. But you might want to try. Do you see what I mean? So... This is very powerful. When you're taking it inside and feeding on what Jesus has done for you, it will have a powerful impact in your body. Now, behind me, I think we've got the words. So shall we stand together and take... So we're going to take the wafer first. So we'll stay together. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. It is for my healing and my family's healing. Thank you that by your stripes... By the beatings you bore, by the lashes which fell on your back, we are completely healed. I believe and I receive. Amen.
So now let's take the symbol of Jesus' shed blood. Thank, Thank you, Jesus, Jesus for the for new covenant cut in your blood. Your blood has brought me forgiveness and washed me from every sin. I thank you that your blood has made me righteous, and as I drink, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and prosperity. Amen. 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 So thank you, Lord, that you've fed us on your broken body and shed blood. We thank you that has power on the inside of us. We also thank you for reminding us this morning that to live that one life and to live it, we need you, Lord. We can't do it, as I mentioned earlier, in our own intellect or our own strength or the strength of others or anything else like that. We can only do it through you, Holy Spirit. So we thank you that you're in our lives. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to infill us, every part of us, and lead us deeper into your word, lead us deeper into the things that you have for us in this life. And we thank you for favor and opportunities. We thank you that you've not just given us words over our lives, but you've given us favor with people maybe in authority above us, with people maybe at work, with people we meet with favor. But you've also given us the opportunities, Lord, the practical opportunities for this one life to live it and to make that difference. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Amen.